Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you. Glad you're with us for another Bible class this morning. Hope you all have had a good weekend. Um, as we get started this morning, let's uh, begin by going to God in prayer. Are there any prayer requests in particular that we want to lift up this morning? Uh, I have not heard any any update from from Wanda. Does anyone else perhaps have any news? Okay. We'll certainly continue to pray for her. Uh, one prayer of, of praise. I mentioned this. Um, I suppose it was it should have been last Sunday morning. If not, it was last Sunday night. A couple of neighbors of ours. Uh, their names are Morgan and Ryan. Uh, they were pregnant, expecting a girl. And she was going to have to be induced because of some factors going on. They felt that was medically necessary. Well, she went into her own labor about three hours before be, uh, becoming induced. And so she was able to have the baby the way she had wanted to have the baby. And the delivery was, uh, everything went well. They're home now. We've been able to see the baby. Um, and so prayer of praise. It's Morgan and Ryan and their daughter is Emily. And so prayer of praise that they're doing well. Anyone else? Nathaniel. Thank you. Yes, we want to pray for Ruth. She's uh, not here with us this morning. Certainly. Right. We'll certainly be praying for, for both of you. And I'm sorry that that it is so difficult right now. Her surgery is a little less than a month away at this point, correct? I'm going to pray for Ruth and Jim. Ruth is in a lot of discomfort and pain, and that's why she's not with us this morning. Um, but pray for Ruth and Jim with Ruth's surgery coming up in September. Sue. right we truly are and sometimes when we jump right into prayer requests we can neglect that so thank you for mentioning that okay well if that's um, our prayer request for this morning then bow with me and let's pray father god we come before you and we thank you for another uh, day another first day of the week when we gather together to worship you and to see one another and be encouraged uh, we ask that you bless this time in Bible study, bless this uh, time in worship as well. Uh, Father, we uh, are so grateful for the blessings you've already poured out on us this day that perhaps we don't even notice, perhaps we take for granted. We thank you for all the ways you fill our lives with your presence and your goodness, uh, the various uh, gifts that you give to us. Uh, we thank you so much for them. And it's with that heart of thanksgiving that we also want to lift up uh, these requests. Uh, those we know who are struggling or hurting, those among our church family who need you in different ways. Uh, we especially want to lift up right now our sister Wanda and pray that you'll continue to watch over her uh, physically with the health complications she has going on and the various tests that they've been running. And we ask that you will be with her, be with her family uh, while they're with her. And we pray that, um, that she will also know the love of this church family. Father, we also want to lift up uh, our sister Ruth, that you'll bless her with uh, the great discomfort she's in right now and pain leading up to her surgery. Uh, bless Jim as, she, as he uh, takes care of her and as they uh, navigate this time together. Uh, we pray that you'll bless Ruth in the time leading up to the surgery and that you'll bless the surgery also. Father, we want to give you thanks for uh, Kelsey and I's neighbors, uh, na uh, Morgan and Ryan. We thank you that, um, that the baby was delivered uh, healthily and that the mother's doing okay. We thank you that Emily's doing well. We ask that you bless that, uh, that now family of three as they transition and as they uh, bless Morgan and Ryan as they watch over Emily. Please bless her health. Father, we, uh, again, are aware of so many blessings that you give us, uh, so many things that fill our lives and fill our world, and uh, we're so grateful for them. And especially in times that are challenging or dark, uh, help us to remember that those blessings continue and that your goodness and love um, are greater than the challenges we may encounter in this life and that uh, with you we can overcome. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. 
Well, um, we are uh, now in the travel narrative of the Gospel of Luke. We've been there for a few weeks now. This is about 10 chapters uh, making up a large middle portion of Luke that uh, chronicles, I guess you could say, traces Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, from Galilee to Jerusalem. And he has a lot of teachings in this section about our own journeys, our own journeys of discipleship, our own journey, journeys of faith. Uh, and so we have been in this now for a little while, and we spent the past couple of weeks uh, reading instructions Jesus gives to a large number of disciples, so 72 disciples, as he sends them out uh, on their own journeys. And he sends them out as missionaries. Uh, he sends them out to prepare the various towns and villages for when Jesus arrives. They're meant to prepare those towns and villages by proclaiming the kingdom of God, by uh, performing miracles that confirm that, yes, they are proclaiming the kingdom of God, God is working uh, through them. And so last week, let's see, there we go. Last week, uh, we read um, when the disciples come back from their mission and they rejoice at their success in this mission. We read then how Jesus tells them not to focus on the power that they have in casting out demons and these types of things, but to rejoice that their names are written in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to express uh, his own joy um, in these kinds of things as, as he, he rejoices how these things are being revealed to uh, what he calls little children, referring to his disciples, while the wise and the understanding of his world, the religious leaders, uh, perhaps kings, philosophers, the the, the wise and, and the understanding, they actually do not understand uh, these things. And so this is the reversal theme that we've seen um, throughout Luke at various points so far. And so that's what we looked at last week. And uh, the travel narrative will now shift into uh, some more teaching moments uh, by Jesus. And the next uh, passage in the travel narrative is a parable. And it's a parable found only in the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the most famous of Jesus' parables. The next passage in the travel narrative is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so we'll look at this parable, and then um, hopefully, if time allows, we'll look not only at the parable, but look at some other teaching moments that happen after the parable um, as well. And so as we move into to lengthier teaching sections uh, in, in the travel narrative, I, I know I've said this before, but I just want to say it uh, again. I am hoping, my plan is for us to look at every passage in the travel narrative, but we won't be able to look at every passage with the same amount of detail. Uh, some will be more detailed than others. So I encourage you on your own time to, uh, to also be reading from this section of Luke. So again, uh, our, our next uh, teaching moment from Jesus is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, but before we jump into it, um, I'd like us to set the stage uh, a little bit. So right before we read the parable, uh, we read Jesus speaking to his disciples in private, and we read that last week. Um, and then uh, we immediately read that a lawyer comes, in verse 25 of Luke 10, we read that a lawyer comes to put Jesus to the test. So we have this sudden shift from Jesus speaking to his disciples in private um, to now a whole different person being involved in a conversation that is probably quite a bit more public. This lawyer comes to Jesus to put him to the test. These kinds of tests in Jesus' culture often had an honor and shame element to them, which requires onlooker, onlookers to be present to make an evaluation of, of what's going on. That's why I say it's probably quite a bit more um, public. Now, as we've said in here, uh, the Gospels are not written in strict uh, chronological order. The, the Gospel writers did not feel bound to strict chronological order. Um, and so it may be that Luke has simply moved from one moment to another in his narrative that didn't necessarily happen sequentially, or, because it's not always easy to tell when we're going in chronological order, it could be that this lawyer has kind of interrupted this private conversation uh, that Jesus has been having with his disciples. Uh, so it's easy for us to read the parable of the Good Samaritan on its own, kind of in isolation from everything that's going on around it. Um, because it works very well on its own. The parable of the Good Samaritan doesn't need a ton of context for its message to still really strike us. But still, it, it does fit well with what is going on around it. Uh, and this, actually, this passage, this parable, and two passages that come right after it, all three of them fit very well uh, together. 
So in verse 29, um, the parable is told in answer to uh, a question that the lawyer asks. He asks who his neighbor is. The parable is told in, answer, in response to that question. So love for neighbor is the focus of the parable. Well, then in the next passage, the passage after the parable, we read that Jesus is now at the home of Mary and Martha. And we'll talk about them a little bit, if time allows, uh, this morning. And we read in verse 39 of that passage that Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and listening closely to his teachings. And we'll see, if, if we have time, that Mary here serves as an example. She serves an ex as an example for what is most important. Being faithful disciples involves listening closely to Jesus. So we first have love of neighbor, and then with Mary and Martha, we move to devotion to Jesus. We move to love uh, for Jesus. And then in the passage after that, uh, the disciples will then ask Jesus to teach them to pray. And Jesus will go on to teach them the model prayer, which is directed to God, of course. It's directed to the Father. So we have love of neighbor. We have devotion and love for Jesus. And then we get devotion and love uh, for God. And they're all given to us one right after uh, the other. And so that's something that binds these three passages together that, that I'm hoping for us to look at this morning. And again, chronological order can be kind of difficult to establish sometimes, but even if these events didn't proceed in this order, it seems like Luke wants us to see the relationship between uh, these three passages. All right, so with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and start looking at the parable now. Uh, would someone be willing to read for us uh, Luke 10, 25 through 28. Here we go, Doris. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Okay. Thank you, Doris. So the account of the parable begins with a lawyer putting Jesus um, to the test. Now, this lawyer would not be a lawyer in the modern sense. He's not an attorney or something like that. This is someone who has been trained as an expert in the Jewish law in the law of Moses, right? So he's very familiar with these texts. That's, that's what it means by a lawyer. He knows the Jewish law really well. And he asks uh, a question of Jesus that Jews actually were commonly asking in Jesus's day. And, and we see this in like other surviving literature and things. And he asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus will answer this question with a question. He answers the question with a question. And it's a really appropriate question to ask someone who is an expert in the law of Moses. It's like, well, you're an expert in the law. Um, how do you read the law is what Jesus, Jesus says. And notice how much Jesus really likes the lawyer's answer. Uh, the lawyer actually gives the same answer that Jesus will give on other occasions. When Jesus is asked, what are the greatest commandments in the law? Uh, the, the, the lawyer says, love God entirely, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus tells the lawyer, if you, if you will do that, if you will enact these verses, uh, if enact these teachings, then, then you will live. You will have eternal life. And so if the account ended here, like if this was all, the, all that we had, uh, we would assume probably that the lawyer and Jesus really ended on good terms. And the lawyer would have approved of Jesus' answer. Uh, um, Jesus would have approved the lawyer's perspective. Um, and it would have ended well. But of course, as we know, uh, we're not done yet. So we come to the next verse, Luke 10, 29, where it says, But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So the lawyer wants to justify himself. And again, if this is kind of a, a public challenge or test, when the lawyer is wanting to put Jesus to the test, uh, with honor and shame on the line, and that's probably at least part of what's going on here, then the lawyer's question makes really good sense because he is, a, he is a law expert. He is a law expert. And Jesus over here is, is a traveling teacher from Galilee. 
wandering around from village to village. So the trained expert naturally wants to be the one to come out on top, or, in, or he ends up looking pretty bad, right? I mean, socially speaking, he should be the expert. So he asks this follow-up question. He says, well, okay, who is uh, my neighbor? And Jesus will go on to give an answer that definitely would have stunned the law expert and, and would have stunned those who are witnessing this challenge happen. And he does it in the form of a parable. So I see Barbara's already got the microphone. If you would, read for us verses 30 through 37. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by it on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, well, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. All right. Thank you, Barbara. So Jesus tells a story of a man in desperate need because of how terribly he's been hurt by others. He's been assaulted by robbers, and he's saved. He's, he's beaten and left for dead, near death, but he is saved because someone shows him compassion, Jesus says. And who is it in the parable who shows this man compassion? It's the Samaritan, right. So this Samaritan, he binds up his wounds, he so he takes immediate care of him, and then he takes him to an inn, for his longer term recovery, and the Samaritan will pay for that out of his own pocket. Uh, so it's a great display of hospitality. And hospitality is always important, but especially in ancient times um, where you didn't have as many social safety nets, you were really just relying on the goodness of others for a lot of things. And so this man shows great hospitality. So I'd like us to sink in, I'd like, I'd like us to let it sink in for a moment that it's a Samaritan that shows this great hospitality. A couple of weeks ago, as we were reading the opening verses of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, we read Jesus get rejected as he's passing through an area looking for a place to stay. Does anyone remember who rejected him? It was the Samaritans. He's passing through Samaria and looking for a place to stay, and the Samaritans don't want him because they realize he's going to Jerusalem. And does anyone remember in that moment... James and John are there. What, what they want to do when Jesus gets rejected? They want to burn down like That's right. They want, they want to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did to consume them. And so this illustrates really well. Luke has already illustrated for us a couple of chapters ago. Well, just one chapter ago. Uh, illustrates really well the deep animosity that ran between Jews and Samaritans. And we also see it in display, especially in John chapter 4. That's Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, so this animosity between Jews and Samaritans, it had a really long history, going all the way back to the exile, really, in the aftermath of, of Israel's exile. Um, and there were a lot of religious elements involved in that. That comes up in John chapter 4. Uh, the Samaritans actually had their own place of worship, separate from Jerusalem, on, called Mount Gerizim. That's where they worshiped. They also had their own version of the Law of Moses that basically justified their, their place of worship. Um, and they even built their own temple at one point on Mount Gerizim. And about a hundred-ish years before Jesus, uh, the Jews destroyed that temple out of religious zeal. So you can see how deep this animosity uh, goes. Barbara, I saw your hand a moment ago.
Um, I don't remember the exact details of all of that. I think it's from like Ezra and Nehemiah that that, that what yeah. you're referring to. But I know that generally it goes back to yeah Jews who intermarry with people who repopulated the land when Israel was taken off into exile. So then of course they're married to non-Jews, and so their children are then only part Jewish versus the Jews who were pure blood Jews, and so the animosity builds. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 And these other things that they did with their temple and other only just fueled the, kind of fanned the flames of the the animosity. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel, go ahead. Um, so if you didn't hear Nathaniel, he was asking, like, he had heard that Samaria is just a bad place to be, kind of like maybe a really bad part of town or something. Uh, I, I, don't know the, I don't know if it's necessarily a worse place to be than some other part of, of the promised land, um, but at the very least, yeah, that prejudice, that, that ethnic prejudice is definitely strong. Well, it's, and it may also be because it's dangerous, because there is so much animosity, it could be dangerous to go through there. But also there's that concern for ritual purity, yeah, that, that is behind a lot of it too. So we have this deep-rooted animosity between Jews uh, and Samaritans. Um, <clears throat> so imagine here being this Jewish law expert, and Jesus is telling you this parable. Um, and, and you just accurately summed up in a way that Jesus really liked. I mean, you two agreed. Uh, you just accurately summed up what a person must do to inherit eternal life. Love God with all you have. Love your neighbor. But now you're being shown what this kind of love looks like from a Samaritan. In the parable, a Samaritan is showing a Jewish law expert uh, what love of neighbor really looks like. Um, and in contrast, in the parable, we have a Levite and we have a priest, uh, people who would be much closer to the kinds of circles the law expert would run in. We have a Levite and a priest who do not prove to be a neighbor to this man who's been beaten and, and left uh, for dead. So this, in the parable, the Levite and the priest, the Levite and the priest, they probably would have had some kind of self-justification for ignoring this man. Uh, their special services to God would require, we were talking a moment ago about being ritually pure, well, it would require them to be ritually pure. And contact with a corpse defiles a person, not in the sense that they've committed a sin, but it makes them unclean. It makes them unfit for their temple services. Um, <clears throat> and so these two men, it seems, would rather ensure that they remain pure then go see this man who appears to be dead and run the risk of becoming impure um, by touching what appears to be a corpse. The man's been left for dead. Um, Ma yeah, yeah. Mary, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the concern for purity can be a big motivation for someone like a priest or a Levite. But also, if I'm hearing you right, Mary, um, even if that's not a concern, sometimes like when we come across things unexpectedly and we, we can help, we just kind of freeze and we just like, I don't know. What, and it's a lot easier to just keep on going, right? 
And so that could also be part of what's motivating the priest and Levite. Sometimes it's we just we freeze, we make the wrong decision, the clearly wrong decision, and we don't act lovingly like we should. Um, so, again, these two men, uh, it appears that they would rather run the risk, or, or they would rather ensure that they're pure instead of run the risk of becoming impure. And if that's their motivation, that would mean that they are not living out the law the way that the law expert explained it just before the parable. Uh, the law expert, law expert talked about love of God and love of neighbor, but love of neighbor is here being neglected in the name of ritual purity or in the name of whatever else is motivating them. But love of neighbor is being neglected, right? So they are not living out the way that the law expert actually answered Jesus' question earlier. And so Jesus uh, brings the point of the parable home uh, with another question. So once again, he's answering a question with a question. It's this, this, this time there was a long parable before the question, but he's once again answering a question with a question, and he says, which one proved to be a neighbor here? And notice the law expert's reply. He says, the one who showed him mercy. Keep in mind that deep hostility between Jews and Samaritans. This sounds like a pretty reluctant answer on the part of the law expert, because again, it's a Samaritan who just showed him uh, who his neighbor really is, what love of neighbor really is. And so his own prejudice and his own shock at this parable seems to be keeping him from actually identifying the Samaritan as the Samaritan. It's like he wants to give the bare minimum answer. So, well, it's the one who showed him mercy. I won't comment on the fact that he's a Samaritan, but it's the one who showed him uh, mercy. It's a, it's a very generic type of reply. Uh, and Jesus tells the law expert here that he will live uh, if he if he will live eternally if he will live like the Samaritan if he will go and do likewise then he will know who his neighbor is if he will act like this Samaritan. So the Samaritan's compassion here it was not hindered by religious or ethnic barriers or any other kind of prejudice. Um, that's the way the Samaritan lived out love of neighbor. And so the law expert, Jesus is teaching him, he should extend the same kind of compassion, and he should extend it in the same way. So in other words, everyone is his neighbor. If a Samaritan can show love to a Jew, then everyone is your neighbor. He should love everyone as he loves himself. That's ultimately getting at the point of the parable. So I know we've already had some good discussion along the way, but let me just open it up again. Any questions or reflections on anything here before we move on? And I know we haven't been using the microphone, but if we could, that would be great. But any questions or comments? Go ahead, Mary. I don't know where, where it is now. <clears throat> like he was pointing out, this lawyer, well, you know, not really a lawyer, yeah. he was smart. Yeah. And I think a lot of it, he just wanted Jesus to know how smart he was. You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, he was going to trick him, and he was trying to trick him up anyway. But it's like, look at me. I'm smart, and, you know, and look at you. What are you, you know, compared to me? I think he was trying to do this more so than find out the answer to anything. And then, of course, and when Jesus came back with another question, it just kind of prompted him to do more, you know, ask more questions, too. Mm. Well, it's certain, when it says he's desiring to justify himself, I mean, he's clearly asking from kind of a self-centered place. And we'll talk about that more, uh, and it looks like we'll have time, we'll talk about that more when we get into Mary and Martha. There's a contrast between the way this lawyer approaches Jesus and the way Mary is learning from Jesus. Because he knew the answers. He knew what he was asking. He knew what, you know, he already knew the answers to this question that he was asking Jesus. But, of course, when Jesus came back with another, especially about who your yeah. neighbors, yeah. now that kind of probably came yeah. from the yeah, yeah. He got a lot more than he bargained for by putting Jesus to the test. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, um, so we just read the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan shows hospitality to this injured and dying man in the parable. And then Luke will transition to another moment. So the Good Samaritan just showed hospitality to this person. Well, in this next moment, hospitality continues to be important. But this time it's hospitality involving two women, involving uh, Mary and Martha. And they, we don't really pick it up here in Luke, but in the Gospel of John, we pick up that they have this really close relationship with Jesus. Uh, and we see it especially when Jesus raises their brother Lazarus uh, from the dead. But let's read this together. 
uh, verses 38 through 42. Anyone willing to read that for us? Thank you, Ron. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. All right. Thank you, Ron. So uh, here we have Jesus entering a village, uh, and he is welcomed by Mary and Martha. So again, we have a contrast. In chapter 9, Jesus was trying to enter some Samaritan towns and villages, and he got rejected. Well, here uh, is an instance where Jesus is welcomed instead. He's welcomed in by Mary and Martha. So Martha shows uh, great hospitality in welcoming Jesus in. But in the passage, it's actually her sister Mary who is especially commended. Uh, she is the one who is especially commended by Jesus. She is sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to um, his, his teachings. And it's really remarkable that Mary is doing this. It's remarkable that Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. In the world of Jesus' time, in, in that culture, uh, disciples of rabbis, which is essentially what Jesus is being as he's traveling around and, and teaching, they would uh, sit at the feet, so to speak, uh, of the disciples would sit at the feet of the rabbis and, and learn from them. Uh, but this was almost exclusively a man's activity. It was men who would follow around male rabbis, and women did not typically learn from, from rabbis as disciples in this way. Um, and we even get in the book of Acts, uh, as Paul is talking about his upbringing, he talks about how he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Same idea, sitting at the feet of someone, soaking up uh, their teachings. Well, we mentioned before in here, in the earlier chapters of Luke, that women play a really prominent role uh, in Luke, more so in, than in the other Gospels. They actually are prominent in all of them, but more so in Luke uh, than in the others. And so, so here is an example of that with Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Here we see, all right, well, men and women both have full access um, to learning from Jesus and learning from his teachings so that they can imitate him. And I know this sounds super normal to us. I mean, look at us every Sunday and Wednesday. But in Jesus' world, this could have been rather countercultural uh, that this is happening. Um, <clears throat> but while Mary is sitting there uh, listening to Jesus teach, we read that Martha is distracted with much serving. That's the way Luke puts it. So she is playing the role of a host. And that's a very important role in ancient society. And a lot of the time, it's a pretty important role in modern society as well. She's playing an important role, uh, playing the role of a host. And she's doing this all by herself, and so it's quite a lot uh, on her plate. And so she tells Jesus to tell Mary, all right, stop listening to Jesus' teachings and come help me out, is what, what Martha expresses. And Jesus' reply puts things into a new perspective uh, for Martha. It says, Martha is troubled by many things, but only one thing is necessary, and that's what Mary has chosen. What Mary has chosen is something that will last. Um, it, Jesus says it will not be taken away from her. So Jesus here is actually showing Martha um, something similar uh, to what he showed. We looked at it a couple weeks ago. He showed three kind of almost disciples uh, who approached Jesus or Jesus would called one of them to follow him. Uh, and we, when we looked at that, if you remember, they wanted to be disciples uh, but there were other things that they needed to take care of for certain family responsibilities or certain social responsibilities. And Jesus told them flat out, he told them being a disciple of Jesus is more important uh, than all of those things. Well, here, Jesus is showing Martha that being a disciple, sitting at his feet, soaking up his teaching so that you can follow them, being a disciple is more important than even the social norms involving things like hospitality. So Jesus, he's not a typical guest, right? 
He's not your typical house guest. He's the son of God. He is uh, the Lord. And that's the way um, Jesus is referred to a couple times uh, in this passage. Underscoring, he's not a typical guest. He's the son of God. He's the Lord. Um, <clears throat> and so normal guests maybe should be received the way Martha is receiving Jesus. But a guest like the Lord should be received the way Mary is receiving Jesus. Disciples receive Jesus like they don't receive anybody else. They receive Jesus by sitting at his feet, listening to um, his teachings. And we already mentioned this a moment ago, but notice here a pretty strong contrast between our law expert from the last passage and Mary in this passage. Um, the law expert asks Jesus questions because he wants to test Jesus and because he wants to justify himself. Well, Mary doesn't, there's no evidence at all that Mary has any kind of like self-centered, honor-driven uh, motives like that. She just wants to soak up what Jesus uh, is teaching. And so Mary is a great model for us for how to truly listen uh, to Jesus with the right frame of mind, with the right heart. Mary is a great example for us. So before we go on to our last passage for this morning, any questions or comments on Jesus and Mary and Martha? Go ahead, Ron. Uh, well, uh, Mary, she was doing the right thing because she uh, was interested in the Lord and, and his word. And Martha, she was more interested, I think, in carnal things and, uh, you know, the work she was doing. And I think she was kind of aggravated that, uh, you know, having to do all the serving or, you know, put meal together and thought Mary ought to help her, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And it's not that what Martha is doing is is unimportant. It's certainly not that what Martha is doing is inherently sinful. But in this moment, uh, there there's something better to be focused on. And that's what Mary is doing. And so Martha seems to indicate that there's something better Mary should be doing. And Jesus is like, actually, there's something better that, that you could be doing, I think is... And it says it much nicer than that, but that is, I think, kind of the idea. Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Both the ladies' work were important. I can understand Martha. Because Martha is the type lady that we got guests coming. I need to get the house prepared. I need to get the dishes in order. I need to get my right china out. <laughs> and, she was, and she was concerned about that. And as I said earlier, that's important for her and the guest. So yeah. she won't be embarrassed. And when we look at Mary, Mary was looking at the spiritual side. This is what I should be doing. But I, I don't know, it seemed like maybe Moth got upset <laughs> because uh, Mary wasn't helping her. But nevertheless, when we look at it spiritually, Mary definitely was doing the uh, job that God wanted her to do. Yeah. To sit and soak up all the spiritual information she could get. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if I knew someone was coming in town like Jesus, I'll be I'll be ready to go. I'll be ready to listen to him. Yeah. And that's what basically what Mary was doing. But Martha said, "Well, I can listen to him later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get the table prepared for him." Yeah. But nevertheless, they both were right. They both was, did a great yeah. job. Yeah. Well, and and what Martha is doing, and maybe what Mary, what she wanted Mary to do, if it was any other guests that perhaps would be the best way to show love and respect to the person who's coming into your home. But this isn't any other guest. This is Jesus. And the best thing you can do is listen to him. You know, and I think that's, that's what Jesus is perhaps trying to, to drive home. Uh, is your hand up, Chastity? to the guest mm -hmm. is what is being called out and that uh, that she's stressed and yeah. and uh, when you're worried and stressed then you're not focusing on Jesus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but it, uh, you but in John like when Lazarus dies it's Martha that goes out to get Jesus yeah. and it's Mary who's sitting there crying to the corpse yeah. so I'm yeah. like why don't they ever come yeah. Put those two together because well, <laughs> it's like Mary gets all the praise.
Patty and Martha gets all the yeah, food, yeah, yeah, all the criticism. Well, I, and I, that. I appreciate you drawing that out because it reminds us that it's not like either one of these people are are exactly you know flawless followers. I don't know of how Jesus. many times I've been said that I've been told see the Mary, not the Martha, because I guess I, I'm like yeah. more of a Martha to yeah. people in our culture or something. But um, when you dig into it and you actually, you know, yeah. absorb what it what it's teaching, it's, it's yeah. kind of, you can, it's a different message. Well, and, and so Martha and Mary in this story play a role, but their actual lives are not summed up by this one yeah. story. I mean, Martha in, in John 11 shows quite a bit of faith and yeah. devotion by going to Jesus. So yeah. their personalities and their character is bigger than this, yeah, than this one story. And I think maybe we can forget that and be a little too harsh on Martha sometimes. Yeah. Daisy. And it goes to show that we all have our spiritual gifts. So Martha's mm -hmm. might have been some the go getter, the person that gets things done. Yeah. While Mary is more of the social one, the one that sits and talks with people. So there's a time and place for everything and Jesus yeah. is trying to show that there's a balance also. Yeah. Where you have to use your gifts but also spend time with the people that actually matter. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. Again, what they're both doing is important. Um, and Martha's giftedness may be in the very thing that she's doing. But there's a time and place to exercise your gifts. And there's a time and place to put those on hold. And maybe, uh, maybe lean into someone else's gifts. Uh, maybe lean into what Mary is doing. So, and, and discerning, all right, when's the time and place to, to do? And when's the time and place to... to uh, maybe receive, you know, receive Jesus' teachings. I think that takes a lot of wisdom. So, yeah, that's a great application, I think. Uh, Barbara. Well, it's also a good example of the way we should uh, uh, exhort someone. Uh, Jesus does it with compassion. He yeah. he says, Martha, Martha. Yeah. And it's, you know, I see him saying it in a kind way. Yeah. Um, and the first thing he does is acknowledge her feelings. Yeah. You're anxious and troubled. And yeah. that's a good way to start out when you're talking yeah. to your, uh, somebody who's upset about something. If you've had yeah. a fight with your spouse or child, uh, you know, or anybody, to acknowledge their emotions. Yeah. And then they feel like, okay, you get me. Yeah. yeah and then he goes on to correct her. Yeah. It's a gentle and nice, kind yeah. way. It makes an effect on you. Right. Absolutely. Um, Jesus is not cracking the whip on, on Martha when he says this. He's really, the, the double reference to her name, I think, uh, is a good signal that he's doing this very compassionately and gently. And, of course, in other instances where there's, like, a public dispute with Pharisees, he's going to be quite a bit more severe. And that reminds us that Jesus is aware of people and he knows their hearts and so he's going to respond um, in a way he's going to respond appropriately in light of their hearts their motivations their focus uh, it's not that Martha's heart is hard and she just needs to be rebuked um, and so Jesus responds compassionately yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well um, that was the first bell any other thoughts on this? Because we won't have we won't be able to go too far into the next passage. Any other thoughts or reflections before we keep going? Well, I'll just get kind of get our toe in the water in the third passage, and we'll really get into it next time. Um, but again, so far with our two out of our three passages, we've learned about love for neighbor, and then love for Jesus, and now Jesus is going to teach us about love for and devotion to God the Father. Um, and this also, this passage where Jesus gives us the model prayer, um, it doubles as, as uh, not only talking about love for the Father, but it gives us the opportunity as readers to do exactly what Mary was just doing. Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teachings. Well, now we get the opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet and be taught about how to pray. Uh, so we, we get maybe an insider's glimpse into maybe some of the kinds of things that Jesus was saying uh, to Mary. So Jesus' disciples are going to ask him about uh, prayer, and Jesus is going to teach them about that, and then um, he's going to follow up with a parable about how God hears and responds, how God uh, listens to our prayers. 
Um, and this is a great place to appreciate the interconnectedness of the travel narrative. So last week, um, we read Jesus uh, praying to the Father and saying in that prayer, right, no one knows the Father except the Son, and whoever the Son chooses to reveal the Father to. Well, here in this passage, as Jesus teaches about prayer, this, that's exactly what Jesus is going to do. He's going to reveal the Father. Uh, he's going to teach about prayer, and in the process, he's going to teach them about the character of, of the Father. He's going to reveal the Father to the disciples. Um, <clears throat> so let's just read this. Again, we, I know we can only get so far this morning, uh, but I'll just read this for us. It says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So this is Luke's version of the model prayer. And if you're used to a more filled out version, uh, that's probably because we typically learn Matthew's uh, 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 version of the model prayer. But this is Luke's um, version. So the disciples, they see Jesus praying. And uh, they want to know how to pray. So this is really good discipleship. Uh, when you see your teacher or when you see your, your rabbi doing something, well, if you're really following that person, you want to do things the way that they do it. Uh, so they, they ask an appropriate uh, question. Um, before the bell rings, let's just take a minute to, to just appreciate the contents of Jesus' prayer. So first we have acknowledging God as God and giving him uh, praise. Second, we have a, a prayer for God's will to be done. Uh, Jesus says, your kingdom come. Well, of course, if it's God's kingdom, then he's king. He rules over it. So if his kingdom comes, then, then his will is going to, uh, to be done. So it's a prayer for God's will to be done. And then we have a prayer um, asking for daily needs to be met. Uh, specifically here, a request uh, for food. And then we have a prayer asking for uh, forgiveness for sins. And that request is rooted in the forgiveness that we extend um, to others when they are in our debt. And then we have, uh, at the close, uh, a prayer for deliverance from temptation that would lead to still further um, sins. Any questions or reflections on the, the basic contents of Jesus' prayer? Yeah, I've, I've heard that question before too. And I've heard some people say that we shouldn't really pray that aspect of the prayer anymore because the kingdom has come. Um, the more that I have read the Gospels and, and, and I guess the New Testament in general and when it refers to a kingdom, the more I've thought that it actually would still be appropriate to pray this prayer. Uh, because the kingdom in the New Testament is kind of two things, but they're, they're two sides of the same thing. The kingdom is what God has established as the church on earth, but that kingdom is going to come into its fullness when Jesus returns. Uh, so it is here, but it's not everything it will be. Um, and so it's, I think it's appropriate to pray for the kingdom to come in that sense. And the kingdom as it is now, the church, still has a lot of mission work to do, right? And so praying that the kingdom will continue to grow out into the world, I think, is also appropriate. Um, so because of those things, yeah, I, I think it's still appropriate to, to pray for God's kingdom to come. That was, that was, the, was that the first or second bell? Second. That was second. All right, so we'll just dismiss here. Uh, but thank you, everyone, and we'll have worship in a little bit.